what is a feast without food and drink? I was delighted when I asked Alexis, our marketing manager, whether she would do a Tudor cooking program for us. And she said yes. Alexis is previous MasterChef contestant and she also had her cookery school. It's quite wonderful to have a chef in your office. Um, so Hal is ready. I'm ready. Strawberries are here. Hal's beer is here. Or if you prefer, Magdalen College School champagne perhaps. So enjoy and have a wonderful time in the kitchen with Alexis and her sous chef and partner Dan. Trying to do this on your own, but you wouldn't, would you? I mean, <laughs> you'd, you'd have a you'd have a, a lady to help you, like you. Yeah. Marvellous. Okay, so I need to mix this up. And also, this wouldn't be speedy, would it? No. You'd have to say, I'm going down for dinner, I'll be three hours getting changed. <laughs> I just want to point out that I've never been a dresser. I have been a stage manager in my previous life, so um, this is all new to me. Now she tells me. <laughs> <laughs> so the next item is the bum roll. Bum roll. <laughs> Which I'm presuming goes near your bum. I think so, <laughs> yes. Listen, this is social distancing Tudor style, isn't it? Because it's like, keep away from me. You can, or maybe it's just a snack shelf. I have maybe. had a test and it's negative, so don't worry anymore. <laughs> um, right, right. Let's, let's, let's do it then. So, okay. okay. Let me go. Um, so it sort of goes around your so, yeah, so to, I suppose, Yes. Actually, I think a bum roll was the, was the pinnacle of my achievement in gymnastics at the school. <laughs> that's all I ever managed. Uh, check, check, me roll. Do you think yes, it's quite high up. But yeah, like, I, I suppose. Yes, OK, I think that's good. Yes. Yeah, little shelf, you see. If you get peckish as a lady of the court, you just pop a Jaffa cake on the back there, wouldn't you? And then you just reach around. <laughs> no one would know. So this is the red four part, which also has a lovely, lovely lining. Okay, that which double bubble. We're probably not going to. No, see, but are we? you know, you could change your frock halfway through the evening, and Henry would never know. You could just swap it round. Look at that. This my, my corset's falling <laughs> off. It's all very good. Right, I'm, I'm very hot, by the way, but that's fine. On you go. So this is like an apron. Okay. Is that what we're thinking? Yes. And uh, this will show through when I put the lovely gown on, won't it? A many layered effect. A many layered effect. It's no wonder that Tudor women, if they fell in a pond, drowned because the oh. weight of all this would just drop. So, do down. we have to do any more? No, oh, I don't think okay. so. I think that might be. I don't know, maybe that's if you go parachuting in it as well. I don't know. I'm sure it's fine. We need to say a very big thank you to our friends at Past Times Living History because all of this has been provided by them. Thank you for trusting us with your beautiful outfit um, and I hope I do it justice. And now we've oh, got the wow. actual gown. So let's see. Um, <laughs> put your arms up, put your... Right, OK. I can't, I can't, I can't see the end okay. of the tunnel, Karen. <laughs> I need to walk into the light. I need to walk into the light. <laughs> There's an arm. There's that arm. Okay. There's another one. Are you okay in there? Yes. Are you suffocating? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Very hot. Oh, oh hello. Oh. Hello. <laughs> okay. Oh, and more, more corsety stuff. Oh, good. <laughs> I didn't have enough laced up things on. That's good. This have been whalebone in back in the day. Oh, I think so. Whales. Poor whales. How are you feeling? Hot. Hot, tight, hot. Not very glamorous, but <laughs> there we are.
go. Wow, well twirl. done. We have the red cuffs now for some reason. <laughs> okay, very good. Just what so, you need, an extra bit of yeah, sleevage. Oh Nothing up my sleeve. <laughs> Nothing up no the rabbits. No. <laughs> now this is quite tight, this okay. little cuff. Oh, Ooh, I think the popper's come adrift. Hang on, hold on. There we are. Do you need to... I, Actually, you could... Oh, no, I think... Mm, okay. Um, shall I just... If I, if I squish my hand up a little bit more, I think we'll get there. Uh, okay, good. Do the poppers need to pop again? Does the... Might just lose that. <laughs> it's not broken. Right, very good. Okay, and that's good. Okay. Actually, if you were a prestidigitator, are you impressed? If you were a prestidigitator, you could have an entire rabbit up this sleeve. There is room for a dove from above. Right. What are you doing, woman? It's right. I'm pulling this together. I'm going in. Okay, I'm going go in. in. Right. Yes. That's it. So, little. Puffy bits there, puffy bits there, I think. Very good. Okay, let's look at my list. So we've got your hat now, or Beautiful. hood. Yes, lovely. Um, but I think you need to do something with your okay, hair for yes. this. No hair must show. Preferably no hair. Yep. You can get okay. the uh, clippers out. Okay. <laughs> Lockdown haircut coming up. <laughs> okay, right. Lovely, lovely. Okay. I crown you, <laughs> Miss Festival. 2020. <laughs> We've got a lovely widow's peak there. Is that right? Do you think that's right? Far I think back. Do I look suitably regal? I don't think I'm an actual queen. I think I'm only senior. Senior lady of the court. Lovely. Are we there? Do we think that's it? Look at that. All set to cook a three course meal. So, I'm fully dressed up as a very important lady of the court. What do you think, Derek the Cat? You're yawning. Everyone's a critic. So here I am in my beautiful costume and thanks again to Pastimes Living History for lending it to me. And thank you to Karen for being my dresser. She did a really good job. I might keep her on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ingredients that go into this recipe, although fear not, I am going to change out of these beautiful clothes before I do the actual cooking. But I wanted to talk a little bit about them because they all have particular resonance in the 16th century. We'll start with strawberries. These were a real favourite of uh, King Henry VIII. He had quite a sweet tooth. But the strawberries that we see today are huge. And in the 16th century, these would have been tiny. They would have been more like what we get as wild strawberries these days, which are, which are tiny, more the size of a raspberry. So these are a much bigger version. Um, Galingal, which is a really interesting um, uh, aromatic. It's, it's closely related to ginger. So it's a tuberous root, just like ginger. Slightly more flowery, I think, the, the taste of galangal. Very, very widely used in Tudor cookery, and we use it today in Thai cookery, Asian cookery. It's delicious um, to add to things, really adds a, a very interesting flavour. And then the last one I want to talk about is saffron, because this recipe uses saffron. And again, this was used a lot in Tudor cookery, and saffron these days is probably the most expensive spice that you can buy. Um, and they used it very widely. Uh, and they even had an expression, because the herbalists back in Tudor times, they thought of saffron as being a tranquilizer and an antidepressant, made you, made you jolly. And they had a Latin expression, which I'm going to read, which was, dormerit in sacco croci. I do apologise to any Latin scholars watching, because I don't do Latin, so apologies if I've pronounced that wrong. But what it means is, he has slept in a sack of saffron, so he's very jolly, and why wouldn't you be? So those are the three that I wanted to focus on whilst in my beautiful costume. And now I'm going to do a quick change and get on with the actual cookery. Karen! We have a, f a bit of jewellery for you now. Lovely, a bit of garnish. Lovely. Um, so I'm going to try not to strangle you if while you I do this. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
do you think? They won't be in, don't oh, worry. Oh. Oh. Okay, good. Oh, hello. Right, I've got my, my assistant dresser here <laughs> with the socks. This is the, um, this is the technical shoulder pad piece. <laughs> <laughs> so these are custom made. Yeah, yeah. Actually, they're, they're, so they're ducks, little ducks. Very, very nice. I think, I think that whoever wears this normally for past times living history has taller shoulders. <laughs> Socks optional. Socks optional. Uh, you could also use an old pair of pants. <laughs> or you could use... Um, or some stale bread. Some stale bread or some cut, cut down toilet roll holders. <laughs> Better? With or without? Without. Better with or without. <laughs> Wait. No, nobody would ever know. No. Fortunately, we didn't film this part. <laughs> So, the Tudor costume is hung up safely out of the way, and wearing something a bit more practical, let's get on with the cooking. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the recipe. Uh, Henry VIII had a very sweet tooth, and he was also a very big fan of strawberries, so this seemed a very appropriate recipe to make for OFA Virtual. Now, originally, this comes from the Harley Manuscript specifically from the feast section in the book of cookery and within that there's a chapter called pottage divers in other words diverse forms of pottage and pottage is just a thick sauce or a soup so, and this particular recipe can either be served with roast chicken or as a refreshing dessert which is quite interesting really because you think well is it sweet or is it savoury i suppose it's a bit like us serving cranberry sauce with with turkey or a cherry sauce with duck it's that similar kind of thing but it is a sauce essentially it's a sauce which is maybe an odd thing for us to think about when we think about serving a dessert because we don't really serve a sauce on its own so that's a little bit about the background to this particular recipe now we're going to go through all the ingredients and check that you've got everything ready so that you can cook along with me. Right, let's do our ingredients check. So this is a really good discipline to get into if you're cooking at home. doesn't matter what it is you're cooking. Get everything out, weighed up, ready to go before you start the process because that way you'll know you've got everything. That's when you discover, oh, I'm missing an ingredient, which is a much better time to find out than when you're halfway through the recipe. So let's go through what we need for this particular recipe. We're going to make our own almond milk. Now, of course you can use almond milk from a carton, that would be fine. I thought it might be a bit more authentic to make our own. We are cutting a corner a bit though because I'm using ground almonds. Um, you can make almond milk with whole almonds, but it involves soaking them overnight and we needed to be a bit speedier. So I'm using ground almonds and water to make our own almond milk. And then we'll go through the constituents that actually make up strawberry. You'll be surprised to know Strawberries. I wonder how long it took the chef to think of the name of this dish. Hmm. Anyway, so we have got lovely ripe strawberries, really sweet and lots of colour, and that's important. We've got sugar. Now, I have actually halved the quantity of sugar in this recipe because it was so much. I know Henry VIII had a very sweet tooth, and using lots of sugar back in the 16th century was actually an indication that you were very wealthy because poor people maybe might get a little bit of honey every once in a while, but sugar meant you had the big beans, but I've halved it because it was teeth itchingly sweet. Um, so I've got granulated there, caster sugar would be fine. Um, Bit of butter. If you want to make this a vegan recipe, just omit the butter. Don't bother replacing it with anything at all, just omit it completely. We've got uh, white wine vinegar. Now, red or white wine vinegar would be fine, but do use a wine vinegar, not a pickling vinegar or a malt vinegar. Uh, there's our red wine. 
quite a hefty chunk of red wine. And the recipe called for raisins of Corinth. Now, I was right out of raisins of Corinth, so these are raisins of Whitney, which I'm sure will do the job. Um, you could use sultanas, any dried fruit like that would be fine. And then finally, here are our beautiful ground spices. So we've got ground ginger, ground cinnamon, a good pinch of saffron, and a good pinch of white pepper as well. The only thing that's missing is our gallon gal. And I'm gonna show you a really handy trick with fresh gallon gal, and I'm just gonna go and get it from the freezer to show you. So the thing about fresh ginger and fresh gallon gal, because they're both tuberous roots, is that you buy a big pan of ginger or whatever, because you actually need about that much of it for the recipe, you put the rest in the salad drawer, and then over the course of the next two weeks, it goes all wizened and dry until it looks like a mummified finger, and then you throw it away, and it's incredibly wasteful. So here is the trick. With ginger root or gallon gal, you throw it into the freezer. I don't even bother with a box or a bag, and I don't peel it, I just chuck it in whole. So there is my lovely frozen gallon gal. Works perfectly well with ginger as well. And what it means is when you come to need it for the recipe, you can grate it from frozen, which is a heck of a lot easier than grating from fresh, because these tuberous roots clog up the grater and make a terrible old mess. So you grate from frozen. Don't bother peeling it. Don't worry about the peel. No one will notice a little bit of peel. It just is invisible in the mixture. So great from frozen, and then you get a lovely little pile of gallon gal or ginger snow. Now because some of that will be frozen water, you need to sort of squish it down with your finger a bit to see how much you've really got, because it can be a bit deceptive otherwise. I reckon that's about right for this recipe. Half, quarter to a half a teaspoon. I really like the flavour of gallon gal, so I'm putting a little bit more in. And there we are, all done. And then when you're finished, you just go and shove this straight back in the freezer. See you in a minute. Right, gal and gal safely back in the freezer for the next time. So, first thing we're going to do is make our almond milk from scratch. So, I've got my roughly 50 grams-ish of ground almonds, got my water. The thicker you want your almond milk, the creamier you want it. Bit more almond, bit less water. So, into the food processor this goes. So, take the ground almonds in, pop the water in. I'm going to use one food processor for the whole recipe because everything ends up in the same pan so you don't need to keep washing it up in between. Right, lid on. Ready? So I blitz it until it looks creamy and that means it's well incorporated. And then, use the same pot again, you need a nice fine grade sieve. And it really does need to be a fine grade because if you use a normal sieve, this will just go boom and just fall straight through, which is not the idea. So in we go with our almond milk. And you're going to have more than you need for the recipe. So, you know, keep the rest, put it in your coffee or throw it in a smoothie, lovely in a smoothie. Um, and then just gently push it through the sieve with a silicon spatula or a wooden spoon it takes no time at all and you'll be left with the residue of the almonds in the top of the sieve I don't really know I mean I don't want to waste them maybe put them in some biscuits or pop it in a cake mix it, it barely adds any flavor I don't think ground almonds taste very much to be perfectly honest um, but they are a lovely agent for adding texture and moisture to bakes so there we go, see how quick that is? So left with the residue in the top there and there is my jug of almond milk all ready to go. So I'm gonna put food processor back together and we'll get on with the next bit of the recipe. Right, I've had a little bit of a tidy up, got rid of the sieve. Uh, there's our almond milk ready to go. So I'm just gonna pop the food processor back together and we'll use this for the next bit. So that's all clipped into place. So now we're going to take our strawberries and our red wine and 125 give or take 
millilitres of uh, almond milk. It's probably worth saying at this point, the original recipe doesn't give you any quantities, doesn't tell you how long to cook anything for, doesn't tell you what it should look like, <laughs> so it's so different to modern recipes. So all of this is a sort of interpretation around the theme. So I'm going to put roughly half of the milk that we've made into the food processor. And that's about right, a tiny bit more, there we go. And again, I'm going to blitz it until we've got a puree. Right, I reckon that's done. Now I'm going to show you the colour of this because this is quite interesting, I think. The colour is, I would say, can you see that? Um, the colour is more like raspberries than strawberries, and that's because of the red wine. And the only ingredient that I am not adding to the recipe that was in the original recipe is something called alkanet. And it says that the phrasing is something like um, drop alkanet about the mixture. Now, alkanet is related to borage, it's part of the borage family of plants, and the root of alkanet was used to dye things red. So obviously, back in the day, ye olde chef thought, well, that doesn't look very strawberry-ish. So a bit of alkanet went in to change the colour. And I suppose if you really cared, you could put some red food colouring in. But I quite like this colour, so we're sticking with it as it is. And the next stage of the recipe is we're going over to the hob. Right, we've moved to the hob. Uh, because I have decanted the contents of the food processor into a medium-sized pan and I'm heating it up on a, a reasonably high heat because we need it to come to the boil before we start working with the other ingredients because we've actually got to cook the alcohol off the mixture. Um, so I'm going to stir this for a little while and then my sous chef, uh, come videographer, come kitchen porter. The kitchen portering's been terrible. Uh, is going to come over and do a close-up, aren't you? Yes, sure. Thank you. Our mixture is now up to boiling. Um, not a rolling boil, sort of fairly gentle, simmering boil. Uh, and this is the point at which we're going to add our thickening agent. Now, in the original recipe, it said, add in plain flour or rice flour. And if you have ever added flour, <laughs> at this stage in the recipe to something that's very wet, you will know that what happens is it just goes into big globules on the top of the mixture and never incorporates. So I'm not quite sure how they thought that was going to work. So I've taken a liberty and I've modernized by making corn flour our thickening agent, which I'm just going to slake with a little bit more red wine. I love the word slake. I mean, I know, I know slake as in the verb meaning quench your thirst, but it's also a culinary term because when you are mixing a thickening agent, either arrowroot or corn flour with a liquid in order to add it to a recipe, that's called slaking. So there you go. Oh, it's like dictionary corner, I tell you. Right, so that is slaked. And I'm going to tip my thickening agent into the pan. There we go. In it all goes, scoop it out. And now, give it a good old stir around, and it will start to thicken quite quickly. So, keep stirring, keep stirring. Don't go away. This is not the point at which to go away and pour yourself a nice gin and tonic. You've got to keep an eye on this. Oh, a nice gin and tonic. Uh, and thicken it up. And there we go. I hope that you can see that that is actually getting reasonably thick so it's a lot less sloppy you can see it's got a bit of body to it now so the corn flour is doing its job and now it's a simple process of adding all the remaining ingredients so I'm going to turn that right down I'm going to go in with our greatly reduced sugar first of all and just let that melt through and then our not raisins of Corinth, our perfectly nice raisins of Whitney, in they go. Give them a stir around too. All the spices, including that nice fresh gallon gal. I'm just gonna give them a little scoop out. Oh, that smells so good. As soon as they hit that, you can just get a waft of the spices coming up. We go. Now they will need quite a bit of stirring in because they are in powdered form, so 
they will do that famous globule thing a little bit to a much lesser extent than flour would. So they will take a little bit of mixing in. Oh, it smells amazing. You can really smell the cinnamon, it's beautiful. Right, our butter, which in the original recipe they refer to as white grease. Add a bit of white grease. Mmm, delicious. So in goes our butter. And actually, while that's melting through, you can just add in the final ingredient, which is our couple of tablespoons of vinegar. And I'm going to stand here and make sure that this all incorporates really thoroughly. And I'm then going to cook the mixture for a further five minutes. So I'll see you on the other side. I'm going to show you how to prep a pomegranate because pomegranates are lovely. The recipe does actually say that this should be garnished with pomegranate. They're lovely, but they're a bit of a fiddle. Uh, and I'll just show you what I think is the easiest way to get the seeds out of a pomegranate. So the first thing to do is to take a sharp knife, one of those little serrated fruit knives is great for that, and you are cutting around the whole of the pomegranate, but I'm not cutting into it, I'm just cutting through the skin, or at least I hope I am, because you want to save yourself from pomegranate, pomegranate juice going everywhere. So I hope that I'm just piercing far enough in that I can then get my thumbs into that and prise the pomegranate open, voila, like that. And then just loosen it a little. So you're loosening those little segments so they've got that bit of membrane that runs between them. And just loosen them a little bit and a few of the seeds are already coming out. And then get yourself a bowl, get yourself a bangy thing. And I'm going to use a rolling pin, but a big old wooden spoon would work. Turn it over and just start bashing and you should get, Ooh, try not to drop it like me, and you should get the pomegranate seeds coming out without all those fiddly bits of pith all over them. We've made a completely authentic 16th century dessert come sauce for chicken. Now here it is. It's really thickened up. It really is the consistency of a sauce now. It won't set. It's not like a custard or a mousse or a posset. Um, it will stay as a sauce, but that's what it was intended to be. So I'm gonna decant a bit into a serving bowl. There we go, like so. And then, as my recipe tells me, I will add a few pomegranate seeds to garnish. And then I'm going to ask videographer, sous chef and kitchen porter extraordinaire Dan to come and join me for the tasting. Come on in. Good afternoon. Ah. I am here. I see you've dressed for dinner. Do I look suitably attired? Perfect. I'm pleased about that. What have you got for me? I've got for you a delicious bowl of strawberry. Okay, please continue. Yes, a delicious bowl of strawberry. Original Tudor recipe, don't get any on that shirt. Very good. Now I, I remember when you first spoke to me about this recipe and you brought some in for me to try. Yeah. You said that I had a face like a cat with a furball before I tried it. But then I tried it and I thought it was fantastic. Right, let's give it a go. So you go first. Have a little, have a little taste. It's still warm because it's very recently cooked. And then what do you think? Well, I, I, I absolutely can see why. Warm really nice. on some chicken yeah. would work really well. Yeah. But chilled, I get the sense that could be delicious too as a, as a pudding. It's surprisingly nice. It's got a sharpness from the vinegar mm. and the sweetness from the fruit and the spices coming through. You will not have tasted anything like this. Really, I urge you to have a go at it. It's very, very different. It is lovely. But in a good way. And I don't know, maybe you could serve it with a biscuit on the side or you could maybe even incorporate that into a trifle. I don't know. It's, it's really different. You could have a little bit of cheese with that. You could actually, even that would work. So there you go, strawberry from the 16th century to you. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.